Hello, good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, no matter where you are in the world. And thank you for joining us today uh, for our FinTech Circle webinar, Focus on Green Data Strategies to Reduce Energy Bills and Cut CO2 Emissions. So this is a topic which I know is deep and very close to you, many of, of your hearts across the fintech sector, across financial services, because all of us are thinking about both ESG goals, about reducing our energy footprint, reducing our CO2 emissions, while at the same time cutting costs. And one of the reasons why costs became such a big issue is because most fintech companies, most banks, most insurance companies and asset managers use so much more data nowadays. And they use data for AI, for machine learning purposes. And the more data we use, the more costs we generate. And that's why we chose today's topic really to focus on how and what a green data strategy is all mm -hmm. about. And uh, as a speaker, we've chosen Warren Barry, the director of Bulk. So if I can ask Warren now to join me. Uh, good morning, Warren. How are you? Hi, good afternoon, Susanna. Very well, thanks. How are you? Yes, very well. Thank you. Uh, so Warren Barry is the director of Bulk. And Bulk is a leader in data centers uh, across Europe and who has got an incredible track record of both really focused on sustainability and also allowing, you know, cost reductions so of 50% plus for any UK companies moving, uh, moving uh, and, and, and analyzing and implementing a green data strategy. So that uh, will be the key focus for our conversation today. My name, most of you know me already, I'm the CEO of Fintech Circle. My name is Suzanne Chisti. I will be your host today. And what we are going to do is I will hand over now to Warren to present to you his approach and his recommendations how to put a green data strategy in practice. And then we will open up for a Q&A session. And this Q&A session will be your opportunity to really ask any questions you would like to get answered, uh, any concerns, any ideas, any, any feedback you're looking for your own company strategy and your own company's goals. And so we will go through your personal Q&As uh, questions afterwards. And uh, at the end, you know, the, the session will also be recorded, so it will be available for replay and is available to download and share it as well uh, with other colleagues of yours who might not have been able to join us today. So that's, uh, that's our agenda, and we should be finishing about 50 minutes time. So with that, I would like now to hand over to Warren, Warren Barry, directed Bulk. Uh, so Warren, I'm handing over to you and looking forward to your presentation. Thanks, Suzanne. Um, hi, all. Delighted to be here today and talking to you about this important topic. Um, as Suzanne mentioned, I am Senior Director at Bulk Infrastructure, responsible for the go-to-market strategy and business development activities um, to the international community. So um, before I get into the, the core of the, uh, the presentation deck, um, I'm going to do a quick introduction to Bulk Infrastructure or Bulk Data Centers. Um, it's probably important for, for everyone to, to know or have a flavor for um, who we are as a business. So thanks. If you just click onto the next slide, Glenn. Great, thank you. So um, just a little bit about Bulk. Bulk is a Nordic-centric centric infrastructure business um, headquartered out of Oslo. We invest in, own, and operate our assets using world-class partners and supply chains. We have three business lines, an industrial real estate business, a data center business, and a fiber-based business. I sit in the data center business. So I sit in the, uh, the, the business you see in, see in the middle of those three there. And I'm responsible, as I mentioned before, for the go-to-market and business development um, on a global basis. The four pillars by which our business operates on is we invest in assets that are sustainable, they're infrastructure-based, they are scalable so we can meet our customers' needs now and in the future, and they are importantly located in the Nordics. Uh, the reason we locate our assets in the Nordics is because it is home to one of the globe's uh, renew or it is one of the globe's renewable giants. Um, in this region, we produce um, a hell of a lot of 
hydro energy, which, uh, which obviously bodes incredibly well for these infrastructure-based assets. Thank you, Glenn. So coming on to um, our data center portfolio, we have three data centers in the Nordic region, two of which are, are located in Norway and one of which is located in Denmark. Um, our super large campus is the N01 campus, so the one you can see in the middle there. <clears throat> that is located in Kristiansand, which is um, the, on the southern tip of Norway, um, and it's built for large, hyperscale, high-performance computing deployments. So currently today, we're seeing demand from the enterprise cloud and specialist high-performance computing industries, um, typically from sectors like the finance sector, the automotive uh, pharmaceuticals, manufacturing, and even meteor meteor meteorology uh, sectors. Thanks, Glenn. So, um, coming on to um, why it's important to consider sustainability, and Glenn, if you click to the next slide, thank you. Um, so, to frame the discussion, um, the problem today is growing exponentially and big data apps are having a profound impact on energy use because they are highly compute intensive. So this consequently has a negative impact on the carbon emission output, and the net result is carbon emissions are growing. So the numbers highlighted um, in, the, in the above slide um, compares 2020 to 2025, where we see a tripling of data consumed in zettabytes over a relatively very short period of time. And the interesting little infographic, which is published by the University of Massachusetts on the right-hand side, gives context and benchmarks how many CO2 emissions are emitted through each of these use cases. So clearly, the, on the right-hand side of the, the infographic, you can see the example of the training and AI model which is, resonates with the fintech community or the financial services community, illustrates that this is by far the worst offender compared to the airline industry or even the automotive industry. Um, so quite a surprising contrast there. But, um, you know, this part of society is the largest and fastest growing segment and really does put a spotlight on the demands it places on energy use and carbon emissions, you know, which highlights the need to obviously source the lowest carbon output regions to house this compute. So over that period of time, 20 to 2025, we pretty much see a tripling of data consumed from 64 zettabytes to greater than 180 zettabytes. That has an immediate impact on data center traffic um, and consequently, the, the carbon emissions output. Thank you, Glenn. So, um, coming on to onto this slide, um, you know the uh, the headline and trend graphs are fairly scary when you look at this slide. Um, we are seeing in the slide we are seeing a doubling of electricity consumption and a tripling of greenhouse gas emissions from data centers between now and 2030. So you can see I've highlighted there between 2022 and 2030, there is a doubling electricity consumption and a tripling in greenhouse gas emissions. So uh, we should really take note of these implications and really carefully consider how we as responsible citizens reverse the carbon emissions so that they don't triple over the next eight years. Um, if we continue to do the same things as we are doing today, which is sticking our compute loads in markets that are reliant on fossil fuels, we will never, ever reverse this trend. But if we were to place these workloads in markets that deliver 100% renewable energy and 100% low carbon output, then we can reverse the trend in this graph. So more than often or not, these workloads do not need to be proximate to the businesses and can easily sit in regions that are fairly remote from, from these businesses, such as Norway. Um, that run entirely on renewable energy 
and it is our responsibility as consumers of this electricity to ensure that it is best placed where the planet can best accommodate it. <clears throat> Thanks, Glenn. So, what is the carbon impact in real terms? So the simple fact is that you can stick 12 times the amount of compute capacity in Norway as you do in London and emit the same carbon emissions. So that is probably a stat that's, that's worth repeating. 12 times the compute capacity in Norway to emit the same amount of CO2 emissions as in London. So in this particular slide, we compare London to the southwest of Norway based on elect an electrical consumption of one megawatt of mighty load. And when you break this down into tangible examples, um, this is the same as, you know, 2,137 passenger vehicles being driven in a year, 1,142 residential homes, energy use in a year, 1.1 million gallons of gasoline consumed, and just under 13,000 acres of forest required to absorb the CO2. So that puts it into tangible um, examples of purely placing a workload in a different region that does not need to sit proximate to the business. Thanks, Glenn. Okay, so um, what we have here is uh, pretty much power production across Europe. Um, and this again paints, paints a very, very interesting picture. Um, so the image you see in front of you is taken directly from uh, electricitymap.org. Um, their mission is to organize the world's electricity data to drive the transition towards a truly decarbonized electricity system. Um, and how they depict this is obviously uh, through, through colors and the traffic light system you see in front of you. Um, green indicates um, good carbon um, intensity. Uh, and renewable and low carbon uh, energy production, whilst as you travel uh, through the colors from amber into darker colors, um, that paints the opposite side of that picture. But in principle, what we're looking at is three things on this map. Um, we're looking at how carbon intensive electricity production or consumption is um, ac across the European region. And this is also reflected globally, by the way. Um, and this is pretty much done in real time or updated hourly. Um, we're looking at how much of the electricity production is low carbon and how much of the electricity produced is renewable. So if we compare Norway, um, which is where we have our data centers located to other key European markets, um, the southwest of Norway produces um, 21 grams of carbon for every kilowatt of energy produced. Now compare that to, to other key European markets, such as the UK, which produces 287 grams of carbon, Germany, 292 grams, France, 81 grams, Spain, 84 grams, so slightly better than, uh, uh, than the UK and Germany. But as you can see, that it is far more efficient to relocate workloads to uh, regions that are very, very, have a very low carbon intensity. Add to that 100% renewable energy and 100% low carbon compared to these other markets um, that are still heav heavily relying on fossil fuel production. And then we start to see the why. This is really communicates the picture of why we should be moving workloads to regions that can really accommodate these workloads in a very low carbon intensity fashion. Thanks, Glenn. And I just wanted to add, uh, Warren, to your slide. We also just uh, showed a polling question for our attendees. And, uh, and you've seen probably the polling question popping up on your screens, which was about renewable energy availability, uh, that it is becoming a very real factor in data center energy and sustainability strategies. And how important is this to your business? And Warren, I wanted to report the results back to you. So we have, uh, the result is very unique. It's basically says 100% of all our attendees believe that's the case. So it's really, you know, renewable energy availability is a very real factor in data center energy and sustainability. So everybody believes that's the case. Actually, I've got one now coming in and saying, coming 
also important, so either important or it's very important. So that's the that's the response of our audience. Yeah, thanks, Suzanne. Not surprising at all. Yes. Okay. So coming on to um, coming on to not only are there sustainability benefits for for sticking your workloads into regions that can really accommodate them, um, but there are also vast, vast, vast cost benefits for doing that as well. So not only do you uh, benefit from the sustainability piece, but you realize enormous cost savings. And this is principally down to the surplus of energy produced in this renewable region and the very low tax structure attributed to energy taxation um, in these this region as well. So the slide you've got in front of you, this is illustrative of the power or energy cost difference between running the same infrastructure in London versus running it in Christian Sand, Norway, which is where we have um, our data center. And what we've done is we've simulated this on a real opportunity for 20 megawatts of IT load over a 10 year term using the same parameters for the London market as for the uh, the Christian Sand market. So basically this is a large compute deployment which might be similar to the types of compute deployments you see in the FinTech or financial services uh, arena. Um, this was done back in March, 2020. So of course the energy markets have moved on. Uh, the pricing, uh, the power pricing looks very different today. There are major factors um, that have affected energy costs on a on a European basis, if not a global basis. Um, these prices have risen um, across Europe due to the turbulence caused by a number of factors. Um, principally, you know, the price of, of, of gas being uh, skyrocketing. But I, I guess the important bit to, to note here is, is that the key percentage margin difference is still very relevant. So although, you know, uh, electricity prices have increased, we're still maintaining the same delta, the same gap um, of differential between prices in Norway as prices in uh, in mainland Europe. So here we're comparing, uh, you know, essentially um, Norway and, and London. And as you can see on the right side of the graph, we have a substantial cost savings. So if you look at it in potential, in percentage terms, um, in this particular example, you're looking at 78% lower costs on energy but on average we would say 70 to 80 percent saving on your energy costs by simply putting your workloads into norway versus housing that in the uk for example of course the picture in germany or any other market has a slightly different flavor um, but germany the picture actually looks more favorable um, for norway so the percentage saving could be higher than as opposed to put it in, putting it into germany so in this particular example, we're showing 225 million euros of cost savings over a 10 year term, just purely based on uh, the energy costs across a 20 megawatt load. But relatively speaking, this can be played down to reflect much smaller loads or deployments. So by making these cost savings, which are usually significant, businesses free up cash to develop new products, invest in hardware, uh, refreshes much earlier or, or purchase new hardware even, um, they increase company profitability and, of course, consequently, um, enterprise value. Thanks, Glenn. And again, just to report back, Warren, to you, we were just asking our attendees another question. And the question was, if you could reduce energy consumption costs of your data infrastructure by 50 to 60 percent, would this be of interest to you? And clearly, everybody said it would it would be. So it's yes, uh, uh, because I guess 50% more savings, there's so much more you know companies can do with it. Uh, so very clear yes to this question. Yeah, I mean, data is the lifeblood of, um, of every company, or it's the new oil um, these days. And uh, with the rise of data, you get the, you get the, the rise of data consumption, which obviously has a, a very strong bearing on, on the cost of electricity. Okay, wonderful. Thanks, Glenn. If you if you pass on to the, the next slide. So what are the key considerations and opportunities? Next slide, please, Glenn. Okay. So a little bit about our, our, our campus um, in, in Norway. Um, so our campus is, is powered by hydro energy, and it's located in the N02 region of Norway, which is right on the southern tip. 
where historically this area has produced the lowest power prices in Europe. Um, our campus is fed, if you look at the uh, little um, in, uh, picture on the right hand side of the slide, our campus is fed from 12 independent grid feeds, which take their power from over 100 different uh, uh, hydro pools um, across the southern region of Norway. And this is Europe's largest scale, 100% renewable uh, power station. And bulk has um, two feeds, uh, completely separate and redundant feeds coming from this, uh, uh, this um, highly redundant and renewable transformer station, um, which are directed um, onto our campus. Um, we own and operate these feeds at 132 kV and 110 kV on our own private substations, um, which means our campus is directly connected into clean, green energy at the lowest cost in Europe. So um, we have an infinite amount of power, um, plenty of power to facilitate um, lots of high-performance computing deployments or cloud deployments at the lowest carbon output. In fact, we can help companies get down to carbon neutral um, through um, putting their workloads into our data centers and at the lowest cost uh, in Europe. Thanks, Glenn. Right, so taking a quick look at the campus. Um, so the campus is Europe's large, largest data center campus. It's a three square kilometer or 300 hectare um, campus, which um, is zoned for data center use. We've currently master planned it for about 600 megawatts of IT load. That is a, a very large uh, consideration of IT load, and we are developing that in phases. Um, this particular campus is wonderfully suited to high performance computing solutions that typically are running AI or uh, ML type workloads, um, given the higher density power. Uh, the how higher power densities required. Um, we can customize solutions to suit these workloads with uh, multiple different cooling solutions, uh, utilizing the climatic benefits of the region we're in, where the temperature seldomly climbs above 25 degrees in the summer. Um, for the majority of the year, it's below 18 degrees. So free cooling is very much a thing which has a significant impact on energy usage as well. Um, this campus offers unrivaled expansion and scale. And that's a very important factor you need to consider when you put these workloads into a data center. Can you scale inside of that de data center seamlessly? Can you have your data residing in a location that can benefit from uh, the, the infrastructure you've already put in there? This typically is a big problem for most metro or urban-based facilities. Um, they run out of power, they either run out of power or they run out of space. We don't have that headache at this particular campus. So this becomes obviously becomes a big problem for IT teams wanting to grow in a seamless fashion. We take that problem away as well. Allied to this, we have a world-class 24-7 operational and support team on hand to take care of all the diagnostic and break-fix remedial actions required so that you can treat this as a remote site. You don't need to be on site um, to, to manage your, your workloads and applications. This can be done completely remotely. And as we travel through the presentation, I'll uh, reference, uh, uh, I'll give you a proof case of what we did for a, a effectively a hedge fund, um, a UK headquartered hedge fund that deployed on this particular campus. Um, this, this, this area is also served, or this campus is also served by an international airport. Uh, which is only 20 minutes away. So if for whatever reason you do need to get to campus, you can fly directly into the region. It is not so remote that you can't fly directly in. Thanks, Glenn. Um, so coming on to um, uh, this fiber map, which um, ultimately is a bulk fiber map. So I mentioned right at the start of the presentation, we have three business lines. Um, we have a fiber-based business as one of them. Um, and we build out um, dark fiber, um, uh, terrestrial and subsea cables. Um, so very much an infrastructure play. So from a network or connectivity perspective, Norway is incredibly well connected to the globe with major new subsea and terrestrial fiber systems 
connecting to all major international markets at very low latency. So, um, you know, just to give it a bit of context and a few examples, we are talking about round trip transactions of less than 15, 15 milliseconds going to the UK, Amsterdam, Paris, and Dublin, and between 15 and 20 milliseconds going to Frankfurt, Madrid, and other major intercontinental markets. So it really is closer than you think, and there is plenty of optionality and redundancy for route diversity as well. Thanks, Glenn. <clears throat> so coming on to the FinTech case study um, that I was uh, referred to um, a bit earlier. Um, so it's important to reflect on some proof points. Um, so this particular customer is a UK headquartered um, hedge fund. They decided to build, build out their quant analysis workload in a region that had to offer a truly green solution and significant cost savings. Bear in mind, they have two data centers currently located in London today. And after an extensive search of Nordic options, they decided on Bulk's campus in Norway as it was closely aligned to their key criteria. Um, so by deploying here, they dramatically reduced their carbon emissions footprint, which is a significant criteria for their board investors and, and customers, but also plays strongly into their ESG policies and reporting, ensuring they are a responsible consumer of energy. They've achieved significant cost savings, which has brought forward their expansion plans and helped drive profitability in their business. And not only did we help them achieve these goals, but we also via our partner network, delivered a complete, complete turnkey solution where we assisted with all the logistical elements of procuring, shipping, of hardware, customs clearance, tax mitigation, um, to installation and ongoing support, all done through COVID and completely seamlessly. So this customer, for example, has never set foot on the campus, never been to the data center itself, um, and they, they, we've pretty much deployed um, what could be termed as um, a bit of a supercomputer um, on our campus, delivering 1,440 uh, V100 GPUs, plenty of CPU cores, lots of storage, and of course, um, lot, lots of RAM. Great. Thanks, Glenn. So just to conclude, um, you know, if sustainability and, and carbon emissions are a big thing to your business um, and you're in, interested in reducing um, those two things, um, then you need to speak to um, a data center operator that really can uh, tick the box as far as those two things are concerned. We would love to talk to you. Um, we have a very compelling proposition as we've gone, as we've traveled through the presentation you've seen. Um, on the southern tip of Norway that can easily house these types of workloads. They're not latency sensitive, but we we, we deliver very quick um, speeds between uh, Norway and all key intercontinental markets. So please get in touch. We'd love to hear from you. My contact details are um, included on this particular slide, so feel free to reach out. Um, make a note of those. We'll make the presentation available to all attendees as well. Um, if you're interested to receive it, but we'll also make um, the FinTech case study um, available to all uh, attendees as well. So please reach out and tell us if you'd like to receive that. Thank you very much. Fantastic, Warren. Great. Thank you so much for the excellent presentation. Uh, and now we open up to our Q&A session. So for all of our guests, you can now type in your questions for Warren in the top right corner of the screen where you see the Q&A box. And you can just type in the questions that come through to us. I will read it out and then we talk about them. Uh, so please feel free to, to pose your questions now. Uh, and we, we can see the first one already comes in, Warren. It's about what's the benefit of a co-location data center approach for fintech companies versus a pure cloud platform approach? Yeah, this is a great question, and uh, I suppose the answer to it is slightly subjective, um, but I'll, I'll do my best in answering that. Um, I think cost and control are the main benefits. Um, so the reality is, is that co-location and cloud ca can and should live 
symbiotically together, with Colo doing the grunt of the high-performance computing work on customer-owned or leased hardware and cloud use for back office and web infrastructure applications. So at our data center in Norway, for example, we have uh, on-ramps to cloud providers, and typically our customers uh, deploy their own solutions, but they also link into those cloud providers as well. Um, in the fintech world, fintech startups um, typically have no plans to ever invest in their own um, IT infrastructure. So, you know, in the 21st century, the idea seems absurd to do so. So yet, in a lot of cases, it makes more sense to build that infrastructure and utilize it more heavily. Um, it's much more economical for fintech startups running at scale to switch most or all workloads from cloud to a co-location provider. And as a rule of thumb, you know, 50% continuous workload utilization is the cutover point to make the switch. Uh, and then also, you know, before renting one GPU instance on a cloud, fintech startups must consider the evolution um, of their computational needs. As applications move through stages from prototype through to production. So, you know, that, that's an important point. Really consider those computational needs, not what they look like today, but what are they going to look like in the future? And by getting this right, the startup will avoid, um, or even the, the established business will avoid cloud lock-in and will keep cost, will control costs um, running, you know, at production scale. Yes. I think that's a key topic. You know, when I talk to other fintech companies, startups and scale-ups, often there is cloud lock-in, as you said, uh, which is initially provided, you know, uh, or used by startups just to be on the cloud. But then once they scale and become really much, much more successful, they realize it costs such a spiraling out of control and uh, they don't want to be locked in anymore and look for alter alternatives. So that's, I think, really useful the way you explained it, Warren. Uh, the second question which we've coming in here is about banks and how can banks be more sustainable and show that they actually do something about about climate risk and i guess it's something which i also know from my own experience on the being on the board you know of a uk bank where we need to publish for the regulator our initiatives in terms of reducing climate risk you know so what what how can bulk support banks in their sustainability journey yeah so i think i think one area that needs serious consideration is compensation tied to um tied to esg performance so some banks are making, you know, material strides in this direction, but that's not the case for the majority, which is why this is such a key agenda item in the boardroom. So banks can better establish and communicate focused ESG metrics and targets aligned to, to their identified material issues. Um, so one approach that strongly supports the E in ESG is to look at placing um, data workloads in locations such as Norway that are 100% low carbon and 100% renewable in, en in energy production. So combine that with things like heat reuse and circular economy initiatives that Bulk is undertaking, we can feasibly help banks deliver a carbon neutral outcome. Excellent, Warren. Uh, third question which we've got here is how do you make Bulk's operations as energy efficient and as sustainable as possible? Mm, good question. Um, so first thing to mention, I think, is we take our power fees from the most sustainable transformer station in Europe, delivering 100% renewable hydro energy. Um, we completely aligned to the EU sustainability criteria and goals. We are aligned to reusing heat generated from the servers that sit in our data centers for other industry purposes. And we strongly vet suppliers and OEMs across our supply chain to maintain compliance with carbon directives and sustainable principles. So, you know, even the cars on our campus, even the cars that our operatives drive are fully electric. So we take a very, very sustainable carbon neutral approach to everything we do from an operational perspective. Great. Another question which just came in uh, is, what is the process of switching from one data center to another? Um, so the, the you know the process of switching from one data center to another um, will largely depend on um, how a customer um, 
tries to tackle that. So what I mean by that is, are they keeping the hardware that currently sits inside of that data center, or are they combining that switch with a hardware refresh? Um, and I suppose that takes a lot of complexity out of it. Um, but naturally, there will be um, a cutoff point um, in your lease agreement or in your co-location agreement that you have with a co-location operator. Typically, organizations would plan 12 months out from that, and they would look at either how do I mi migrate my load elsewhere. That is something that Bolt can help with. We have preferred partners um, inside of uh, you know, our concierge of services that can help with the actual lifting, shifting, migration of the server hardware from one location to the next, all of which can be uh, absorbed and amortized into, um, into the costs that we uh, deliver on to our customers. So, you know, no serious upfront costs attached to that. Um, or does the customer take the viewpoint that I'm going to be refreshing my hardware, therefore I'm going to deploy new hardware and new facility, and you coincide that with when your lease expires on your existing facility. So, you know, those are the two approaches. We can help with both of those um, in quite a uh, significant way. Makes sense. Great. Makes perfect sense, Warren. Uh, the next question was about Norway. Uh, so for, you know, companies based here in the UK, the question was, can you tell us more about why Norway is a good location for financial institutions? Mm. Okay. So first thing to mention, I think, is Norway is closer than you think. It's very proximate to all European markets and, and easily accessible. Um, uh, the other thing is we, we Norway, you know, in Norway, we have a very stable and safe political framework with a government that is incredibly welcoming. Um, you know, Norway, we are members of the EEA and early adopters in terms of compliance with EU regulation policies, including G GDPR. Um, we have a, a diverse and redundant high capacity fiber connections into all European markets at very low latencies, and we referred to that in the in the presentation earlier. Um, as a region, we produce a surplus of the most stable and renewable energy in Europe at the lowest cost base. So that in itself is a very very compelling reason as to as to why Norway. Um, and and then of course we have an abundance of of power and land. And which is primed to accommodate the scale needs of our customers. So in the high performance um, um, uh, community, which is uh, essentially what we're talking about here, um, they typically have significant needs that are growing, if not month on month, year on year. Um, so the ability to be able to support those expanding needs um, with large amounts of power, large amounts of land is something that we don't suffer from. I'd say those are the key reasons. Perfect. Makes sense, Warren. Thank you. Another question was about rising energy prices, which we, of course, see at the moment. So it says, in a time that energy prices are rising globally, can bulk still help financial institutions reduce their data center costs? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. The answer is we absolutely can. Um, so I've already illustrated the potential potential cost savings attached to energy, you know, in a stable European market free of instability, um, which essentially is attached to events like we're experiencing right now. Um, but European energy markets are primarily driven by the fluctuation in gas prices, which is why we have seen huge volatility recently. Um, so the delta, however, between Norway and European markets is still very consistent. I think we illustrated that um, in the slides and stands, however, throughout the rise and fall of energy markets. So you're always going to experience, you know, if there's a 70% cost saving between the UK and Norway today, that will maintain. If there's an 80% cost saving between the UK and Germany, that will hold firm as well. Thank you, Warren. Uh, and we, we didn't speak about ri risk so far, Warren. You know, there's one question about risk management. Uh, and I just read it out to you. It says, how can locating HPC data workloads in bulk data centers help reduce risk? Okay. Okay. So that, that depends largely as to how you quantify risk. Um, but I would quantify risk as, as not being able to satisfy your border investors so sustainability objectives, and thereby not being able to secure funding for growth and expansion and product development. 
Belt can immediately help solve those issues. So, on um, you know, uh, that's something we do just by virtue of the fact that we've got all of this renewable energy at very low cost. Um, on the technical side, we have uh, a climate that is very well suited to data center deployments and can deliver all manner of mechanical solutions designed to accommodate, you know, the rigors of uh, HPC environments. Um, this can be very tricky in urban metro locations across Europe where, where you are incredibly space constrained. Um, so HPC workloads by their nature require vast amounts of power and sometimes space. So we have an abundance of this and so can guarantee continued future scale with access to the greenest and lowest cost energy. Thank you, Warren. Uh, and again, for our, our attendees, you know, if you want to ask any questions, please type it in into the Q&A box on the top right uh, of your screen, and then we can come back to your, to your questions. Uh, the next one is about certificates of origins, mm -hmm. uh, Warren. It's, it's the question says, there's a lot of discussion and confusion about certificates of origin. Can you please explain what this is and what it means for financial companies? Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, this is a complex area and probably not well understood by, by most people. But um, in, in a nutshell, the origin of your electricity is determined by, by where you live and where you consume it, where your business is based and where you consume it. So, so that's how it works in reality. Um, it's really hard to be 100% renewable all the time without expensive storage systems. So, you know, as the wind doesn't always blow, um, and if you don't have storage systems storing the the, the, the wind that has blow, blown, uh, then of course you lose access to that energy that was derived. So, so the question really is, so how do electricity retailers beat physics? Um, and they exploit a financial instrument called guarantees of origin. Um, and in some other markets, it's referred to as renewable energy certificates, um, depending on whether you're in the EU or, or the US. But it works something like this. So whenever a renewable plant produces a, a unit of electricity into the grid, its producer is awarded a, a certificate that is sold to the highest bidder. So whoever buys the certificate can then claim that a certain amount of renewable electricity has been produced. But here's where the problem is. So the trade of certificates is not limited in space nor in time. So it means that you can buy a certificate from a region which is disconnected from your electricity grid, which is the space element, or from the past. So without making sure that the electricity was stored, which is the time element. So if electricity transportation costs were negligible, we would be able to always get electricity you know, from a place where the sun shines or the wind blows, you know, if electricity storage costs were neglig negligible, we wouldn't care about when the sun shines or the wind blows as we could just store it. But as transportation and storage are two of the biggest obstacles for a high penetration of renewable energy, certificates completely fail to address the, the real problem. So renewal certificates give the illustration that green ele electricity can be separated from the rest and sent to the lucky subscriber in this case. But unfortunately, once electricity is produced and fed into the grid, there's no way of controlling where it goes. So it blends with electricity from all other power plants running at the same at, at, at that time. So I'm sorry to say, but the electricity you get in your power plug will always be the same no matter what contract you're on. So if the wind doesn't blow in your region, there's no way to be powered by wind power as an example. Okay. So basically certificates of origin are not as useful. That's what you're saying. Not as useful to really judge where the energy comes from. No, it's a concept referred to as greenwashing. Um, and, 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 and so really you are, you, you're buying something that says green, but you're not actually consuming something that is green. Yes. Where we come from is we say, we'll give you the, the certificate of origin. We can prove where that electricity is coming from. Um, because we can tie that right back down to the to the origin of that electricity. Um, and so you're not only buying green, but you're consuming green as well. Great, great. This all comes back to the supply chain transparency, which I know we both talked about as well, which is so critical nowadays that you know really where, where your energy comes from and who your suppliers are, you know, that you can prove that. 
Yeah, 100%. So we've got another question here, which is what sort of costs are involved in moving from London to Norway? You know, maybe on average, and what are the steps involved? Yeah, again, um, you know, one of those things that is really needs to be scoped. Um, it's it's almost impossible to give, um, you know, a headline cost as to as to what it's going to, um, what costs are involved. Um, because every... Every deployment is different. Every customer has a different requirement. Um, some are much larger than others. Some are much smaller than others. So, so really, it does require um, whoever whoever's asking the question. I mean, um, may, maybe it's something we need to take offline and really do, um, you know, have a meeting and 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 look at what the scope is, and then we can give, you know, a proper a prop attach a proper number to that. What what I would say is <clears throat> through bulk supply chain and partners. Um, we do offer, a, uh, you know, a concierge of services that can really get you from A, being London, to B, being Norway, in a very seamless manner at very, very low cost. Uh, and most of the time, we can take whatever that one-time cost is and amortize it over the period um, of whatever the co-location agreement looks like so that, you know, that becomes an operational expense, not, you know, uh, not a capex. Right. That's that's kind of how I would address it. It yes. would be unfair for me to to put you know just put random numbers. Yes, no, that makes perfect sense. I understand it's each situation is different. Obviously, it needs yeah. to be analysed you know individually. Uh, I've got another question about fintech companies. I mean, you talked about your case study, you know, with the hedge fund in the UK uh, and and the quantum hedge fund moving their uh, data, you know, to to bulk in Norway. And and what are the main challenges and concerns for fintech companies now, Warren? Um, again, different for, for, for different types of businesses, but I would say one of the ones that, or, or some of the challenges that we've seen through uh, our engagement with fintechs is, um, w one of the main ones is to control cost, but at the same time have access to flexible and high performance infrastructure in the very early stages of their business. So therefore, you know, the, the attraction to be in the public cloud is, 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 is there. Um, you know, public clouds are, are so attractive and popular because they facilitate this early stage incubation fantastically with free free credits, <clears throat> essentially. But let uh, and let's face it, I mean, investors an investor is never, ever going to question uh, a fintech's use of the biggest cloud providers in the world. It's a bit like no one ever got fired for using IBM. Right. Um, what I would say is. Um, before renting one GPU instance on a cloud, I think fintechs must consider the evolution of their computational needs. I mentioned this a bit earlier. As, as their AI applications move through stages from prototype through to production. Um, so they must, they must try to recognize the scale issues before they get buried by them, if that makes, uh, if that makes sense. Um, but at some point, picking a specific cloud provider to run AI applications using their tooling, their compute, data, and networking services represents as much of a vendor lock-in as buying a, a, a mini computer or mainframe platform did back in the 80s and 90s. So, and, and then, you know, when you add in data egress charges, for example, you know, the cost of moving data off the clouds um, is astronomical. Moving large data sets can be slow in time and very high in cost. Um, so fast moving and fluid fintechs can really get stuck. And and then what normally happens is they try to pit one fit, uh, cloud company against another cloud company um, to drive down the cost, but really it, it doesn't change the fact that they are still stuck. So I think the trick um, from a challenge perspective is to avoid trying uh or tying sorry into any one or any plan you know if conditions change then fintechs if they don't tie into a plan fintechs will be able to adapt by increasing spending on on premises and what i mean by that in this case is meaning the need to run infrastructure in a in a colo facility um or on the cloud as they see fit at any given moment but the reality of what we see is you know don't jump in don't get enticed by the free credits. Really have a look at your uh, how you see your portfolio growing. 
Um, what does it look like at prototype? How might it look like at full production? Take considered steps. You know, do things in bite-sized chunks. Put a little bit into the cloud because that's a very good platform to get up and running. But don't put everything into the cloud. Prove your concept in the cloud, and then take a, a you know, an, an holistic view on on how you might want to run that. Because the reality is, having a hybrid solution will give the company much more flexibility, much greater cost control, more bang for their buck and certainly be far more cost effective. Fantastic, Roy. I think I learned so much just listening to you. It was great to speak. Uh, and I would like to thank our audience very much for joining us today and for all your great questions and being so engaged this morning. Uh, I also would like to say uh, thank you, Warren, for highlighting this key, this key challenge, you know, that which all fintech companies face, everybody faces in financial services today, which is everybody uses big data, big data analytics, AI, machine learning, and costs increasing so much and so quickly. And at the same time, there's a challenge of being being not, not following for greenwashing, not just offsetting your carbon footprint, but actually reducing your carbon footprint and reducing your CO2 emissions. And, and, and with bulk, you can do both. You know, you can cut your energy bills, you can cut your costs, and you also move towards net zero targets. Uh, so it's, it's uh, I think you explained it very, very well, uh, how it really matters, how it, it's how relevant it is, you know, for anybody, any company working in financial services. So with that said, I would like to thank you for joining our FinTech Circle webinar today, Warren. Uh, for all our attendees, you will receive Warren's deck afterwards, his presentation. And also the handout uh, as a gift for you, the case study, uh, what Bulk did and how Bulk supported the UK Quant Hedge Fund to reduce their costs significantly and, and move uh, their data center to Norway. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. And we look forward to speaking to you very soon. And please feel free to get in touch either with Warren on LinkedIn or you can also reach out to us and we can connect you to Warren uh, in order to con continue the conversation. Yeah, and I'll just say, <clears throat> Suzanne, I'll just add to that. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending. But um, my contact details will be in the presentation as well. So if you do want to reach out and maybe arrange one-to-one -one meetings, um, be very happy to do so. I'm based and headquartered. Um, out, out of the UK, um, but not uh, not afraid to travel to any uh, any market around the world. So please do reach out. My contact details will be in the presentation. Excellent. Thank you so much, everyone. Yes, thank you very much, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.